Welcome back, Nicola, and just kind of a corner classic slash non classic. This is episode number 348 and double shot number 276. Okay, first up is Batman by Ibru Baker, volume 2, collecting issues 598 to 607. Pretty much the last 10 issues of Brubaker's run for the series Batman, because right after 607 came the storyline Hush by Jeff Loeb and Jim Lee. And of course, Brian Asbell took over right after that. Um, this is simply put, uh, these issues are pretty much almost all of them, except for like the last few, are mainly just stuff dealing with the Batman Bruce Wayne fugitive storyline and the Batman Bruce Wayne uh, murder and fugitive storylines. That's what pretty much most of these issues are. They're really good issues. Um, there's even a point where, um, when they revealed that the guy who was responsible for the death of um, Vesper um, Fairchild, the person who Bruce Wayne is framed for the murder of, who was his girlfriend at one point, uh, at that point, uh, prior to her death, uh, which was revealed to be David Kane, the father of Cassandra Kane and the former lover of Lady Shiva. He, of course, was hired by Lex Luthor to kill her. The storyline is 14 years old, so I can spoil it. Um, but Batman is forced to also defend David Kane from Deadshot, making his second and last appearance during the Burbaker run of Batman. Um, these are really good issues, and they're all drawn by Scott McDaniel, which he does a really good job with it. Uh, here's some artwork. Yeah, it's just simply put, uh, it's just all the Batman issues, uh, from those two major storylines, and of course the Aftermath stuff. Um, as far as I can tell, this is probably going to be the last trade to collect Burbaker stuff from Batman. The only other thing I could think of they could probably could do with the Burbaker stuff from the Batman era uh, for the for his work in the Batman books, uh, they've already collected his run from Gotham Central. Uh, his run for Catwoman has been fully collected, uh, and now officially his run for Batman has been officially collected. The only other thing I could think of they could do for the put into trade is his run from Detective Comics, which might be Volume Three. Who knows? It depends upon what DC Comics wants to do. Though, from what from I know about his run for Detective, it wasn't as long as his run for Batman. His run lasted from uh, 582 to 607, though he did skip three issues. Mainly because uh, one issue was a tie-in to Officer Down, which I believe was done by Chuck Dixon. And, of course, a few issues done by, um, I think it was Brian, I think it was Brian, Elsa, um, I think it was done by Greg Rucka. Yep, as part of the crossover, face the, uh, 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 it's a, it was the face of storyline. It was a cross up with Wonder Woman, which Greg Rucker was writing at that point. And now Greg Rucker's back on Wonder Woman currently. Um, Burbaker right now is doing the series Velvet from. Uh, I think it's Velvet. And I remember that I think there's one air comic he's working for Image right now. But this is this is really good. And um, after reading all the issues of Breaker's run, despite the fact it wasn't as long as, let's say, some other people's run for Batman. This was still a really good run, and DC made an excellent choice by put, putting Brubaker on the book, especially since he also had done um, the killing, the um, not the killing joke, uh, Batman: The Man Who Laughs One Shot. He wrote that, and he wrote the he wrote the issues uh, Made of Wood, which was basically Batman teaming up with uh, um, Green Lan Green uh, at the Alan Scott Green Lantern, who basically during the Golden Age was based out of Gotham City. Um, yeah, this book is good, nine out of ten. Next up is JLA Volume 9. Now, I have not reviewed the first eight volumes of this, simply because, well, the library's never got their hands on it. Simply put, this is definitely the last trade they're going to do for uh, recollecting this series. Uh, this is a combination of the last two trades they released for this, uh, they collect issues from this particular series, um, when they originally printed. Uh, now, the thing about this particular new printing thing, now, originally, when the, the GLA series was put into trade, they collected all but almost about 10 issues and the annuals they never officially collected. But, as far as I know, they still have not collected the annuals. I do not know why DC has not collected the annuals for the series GLA. There's four of them. And, last time I checked, there's no copyright stuff. I mean, yeah, it's part of crossovers, but who, do, who cares? Just put them in trades. 
this simply put, there are two. There's like three major storylines in this thing. Now, this book collects issues of JLA, the basically the last 19 issues of the series, issues 107 to 125. Uh, first, it starts off with a storyline where the crime syndicate show up. Um, oh, I almost point out that the the writers for this thing, there are four writers for this. Yes, you have Kurt Busiek, Bob Harris. Alan Hemberg and Jeff Johns. Yeah, this was an early thing for Jeff Johns on Justice League. Uh, Kurt Busiek writes most of this. Bob Harris writes the last few issues of this. Uh, Jeff Johns co-writes some of these issues. And Alan Hemberg writes like one or two issues of this. Uh, the first one, just simply put, is basically the Justice League versus uh, the Crab Syndicate. And this is actually one of the two or three remaining times that DC did this, where they had the Crab Syndicate show up in, in a Justice League series, uh, this is one of a handful of times they did this. They also did it for uh, Countdown. They also did it for Infinite Crisis. But at this point in time, um, the crime syndicate was, was not from Earth-3. They were from the Antimonitor universe. Uh, the Antimonitor universe. That's simply where they were from. And Krona is referencing here as well. And then, of course, came uh, the stuff that came right after Identity Crisis, the series done by Brad Millitzer, a very controversial miniseries involving uh, a bunch of mind wipes, um, basically identities thing. Also, the disgusting thing that he that Brad Millitzer revealed about Dr. Light raping Sue Dibney on the, the, J, the first JLA satellite, which even I think that was really disgusting for him to do. And then, of course, I heard later on, and I do kind of believe this because I read those issues, yeah, he had where Dr. Light was pretty much doing the same thing he did in Identity Crisis, basically having rape out of his mind. I do not know why he did that for, for such a beatless villain like Dr. Light. And apparently, uh, Dr. Light was not the only villain that Justice League mind, mind went. They also did it with several others. They did it with, let's see if I can find them here. Uh, let's see. They did it with... If I can find out the names of these, uh, villains. They did it with, uh... They did it with a few others. Hmm. Let's see. They did it with, also, the Wizard, a Golden Age supervillain who's an enemy of the JSA. Kronos, an enemy of, of the Atom. Star Sapphire, a Green Lantern villain who is not Carol Ferris, is one of the other people. Uh, Felix Faust, no JLA villain. Uh, Pharaonic Man, enemy of Swamp Thing and the Atom, Ray Palmer. And Matter Master, I'm not all that familiar with them. And one thing I do love about this storyline is the fact you have Catwoman fighting alongside Batman against the Secret Society of Supervillains. Which, okay, that was really smart of them to do. Oh, and also, this is the Darwin Cook costume she's wearing. Not the purple costume that Jim Fallon gave her back in the 90s. This is this is the costume people like. And currently, in the current continuity, she still has this costume. The only change they made is they gave her a new pair of goggles. That's the only change they made. But I thought this was really... And, and there's even a joke in here. It's like, can I join the Justice League? <laughs> yeah, and I thought that was funny. Now, in before the, con before the reboot in 2011, she never officially joined the Justice League. Though she did join the Justice League in the reboot continuity, the one that started uh, six years ago. She did join the the Justice League America, uh, the one done by I think it was done by it was done by Mac, not I think it's it's how you pronounce his name, the guy who currently writes Ninjak, and uh, also he's going to be doing um, X Amount of War, and I believe he's also doing the Divinity stuff, the Divinity Three, uh, Stalin vs. Cross a mini crossover. But he did put her on that series, so he basically fulfilled a wish probably a lot of people probably did want to see. I mean, Catwoman on a superhero team, that was good. Uh, they even appeared in a comic book for a couple issues, which I thought was really nice. Despite the fact also she did, well, she did not return to Justice League after Forever Evil ended. She just went off to do whatever she wanted to do. But it was nice the fact that she brought up the fact she does, like, she asked if she could join Justice League. Even though they never actually said yes or no. But it was nice the fact they suggested it, and of course the then you have the stuff uh, that come right after that uh, that deals with the immediate aftermath. Apparently, just in the, in the at the end of the second to last arc, the Justice League officially disbanded. 
Though, of course, they came back for the one-year layer story stuff, but... Yeah, it just basically, the rest of it, just, just a group of heroes, just assembling, just taking on random threats across the world. Um, but it's nice. Uh, Bob Harris wrote the last few issues of it. It's still, it's actually pretty good, despite the fact the guy had a very controversial tenure as editor-in-chief of Marvel in the late 90s, prior to Joe Quesada taking over. But this is still really good. I do recommend this, plus the first eight volumes. Now, people love the Grant Morrison issues that he did. Now, he only did the first 41 issues before I handed out to Mark Magic Wade. And, of course, also people like Joe Kelly. Uh, of course, these two guys, Kurt Busiek and Jeff Johns and Bob Harris also did it. Um, there was about close to 10 writers that, that basically... Oh, and uh, John Byrne and Chris Claremont also wrote issues as well. Um, this is just one awesome series. Despite what people say about... Um, at one point, they thought the artwork was really bad. Um, I've read all the issues with this whole series. I have no idea what they're talking about. I thought the artwork was fine. Um, especially in here, the artwork is gorgeous. Um, there's there's a few different artists on you. You have Chris Batista, Batista Tom Derek, and Ron Gardy. Yeah, these three artists are the ones who... Um, do it. Uh, if you want to know who does this cover, that's the, this is done by Rags Morales, who I have met this guy. I met, I met him at, uh, I believe it was Megacon recently. I had him sign a, uh, I had him sign um, Tales of the Black Lantern Corps first issue. Uh, he did the first, he did four pages in it, but he he is credited to one of the artists on there, and Mark Farmer. Um, yeah, but this is also still good as well. I give this a nine out of ten. Um, the writing is great. Um, everybody's pretty much in character, though I think it was odd though they had to fight. Uh, it's interesting though that they fought the Secret Society of Sue Villains just before the series was relaunched. I thought that was great. Uh, despite the fact they also did fight the Secret Society in the relaunch series of Just Like America Volume Two. Um, as far as I can tell, uh, pretty much most of these characters do come back in the, in, the, in, in Volume Two, uh, except for Hawkman. He's the only one who does not. Um, by the way, this is actually a cover for one of the later issues. And the final storyline involves the Justice League taking on Despera, one of their early villains. Excuse me. There's also um, a reference to Justice League America number 1 from 1960. And I do appreciate that. And just by sheer coincidence, and this is not a surprise, Martian Manhunter is in the same issues as Despero. Yeah, my guess is it was Gardner Fox's idea that that had to happen. That's my personal theory. I don't know. I don't know how much pull Gardner Fox did prior to his death. I have no idea. It's just my personal theory. I get this book a 9 out of 10. Alright, that's it for this episode. Stay tuned for the next episode, which is episode 277. And double shot number 270. Uh, 249. Not 249. 349. I think it's 349, correct? Uh, for the next episode. Um, yeah, it's 349, double shot 277. That's next episode. Okay? Until then, I will see you there. Bye.